Good morning, everyone. Good to have everybody here this morning. We're going to have the young children come up. They're going to sing us a song first thing this morning. Do what? No, you don't. They're ready always. Are you ready? All right. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Everybody, will let's all please stand. We'll go ahead and do our morning pledges, please. that said, I'd like all the veterans to please remain standing, and then at that time, I'd like all the choir to come on up at the same time. I want you all to recognize all of our veterans and give them a good hand. All right, the choir would, please. Have all the choir come up. In the gray book, 571.
comes down, everybody, please stand in fellowship. Noticing the new lights. They're brighter, you can tell. Amen. We got a little bit of technical difficulties with, with our prayers, uh, but I'll go ahead and read off the, the names that we have on our list this morning. All right, there we go. All right, take a look at the ones that we need to pray for this morning, and at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and read our announcements that we have. Excuse me. Uh, don't forget our veterans' dinner this upcoming week, uh, November the 20th at 11 o'clock. Uh, bring all your food in about 10 o'clock, I do believe. Is that correct? 10 o'clock? So, also, November the 25th, the children will be uh, participating in going to the Fantasy of Trees. That's on November the 25th, um, 8 o'clock, I think it was. I don't know what time it was. but And also, the ladies are... are uh, still collecting uh, bowls for the butters or the, any type of bowls back there for the back. And don't forget our donations for the Children's Center back there in the back. That's for diapers and all the things, necessities that they need for children. So let's not forget that. Uh, all right. Anybody else have any other prayer requests that we need to add to the list? Uh, Bobby had mentioned that Justin, Tammy's daddy, needs our prayer this morning. Michelle and Brian. Aniston and Alicia, Declan, and Bob and Dolores' son-in-law. Is there anybody else that we need to remember before we go to the Lord in prayer? I pretty much covered them all. All right. Well, if nothing else, we'll ask everybody that will. Let's all come into the altar and let's have a word of prayer.
Uh, may I have the men up for the morning offering, please? <laughs> Brother Jeff. Amen. song amen anybody got a song on their heart this morning Absolutely right.
If I could play this song. Lord bless my finger. Dolores, this is for you. Seeing this, I'd like to give a brief testimony. Uh, my folks lived in, up the hill, actually, for 20 years until my dad died in 06. And I've been coming down here periodically, staying with them long enough to get them caught up on their house maintenance. Well, my dad died in 06, and my mom decided to move to uh, Tulsa. And I was going to just fix up the place and sell it for her. And uh, I got in there, and I was, the more I looked at it, I told my mom, I said, Ma, this ain't a job, this is a career. So. I basically paid her what it was worth, and yeah, I've been there almost 15 years, and I just about got things up to snuff. But I want to say that something happened to me yesterday that I'm still having trouble figuring it out. Uh, it seems that I've joined the uh, septuagenarians. I, Turned 70 yesterday. I still can't believe it's me. And it's like I tell people, I'm still alive and well despite my better efforts to the contrary, only by the grace of God, of course. Uh, I first come into this area to live and I was tr trying to check out, my folks were loyal to the Indiana Baptist Church. I went there a few times, 
But it's difficult being a single guy because I'm usually a recheck no matter where I go. And uh, I went there a few times and felt no welcome. Got invited to a church up the hill from a guy that was here for a while as assistant pastor. And walked in there and uh, the people were looking at me like I just stepped off a spaceship or something. And I turned around and said, well, I don't feel any welcome here. And uh, got up one morning and uh, this little voice told me, well, why don't you just walk down the hill? I golly, I walked in here, uh, I don't know, probably three or four pastors ago. But walked in here and uh, first service I sat down to, y'all invited me to dinner. You can't make a man feel more welcome than that. So you ain't been able to get rid of me ever since. And uh, I just got to say, I, I'm 70, I graduated in 1970, and when I graduated, I told people, I told people I worked with, I said, you know, we're probably one of the most privileged generations this earth has ever seen, because we have seen the very best of our civilization, which I believe peaked about the year I graduated. And I said, chances are we're going to see the very worst of it. And we're headed that way right now. The, the Antichrist pulled the biggest coup this earth has ever seen. With the scamdemic, they eliminated all the governments, closed all the churches and all the schools. That is power that I never would have believed could ever happen. Somebody had told me that 20 years ago, I would have told them they are insane. And now we have censorship. The thing that brings power to every dictatorship is censorship. I used to sit down and read a Sunday paper and enjoy it. Spend the whole morning drinking coffee, reading the Sunday paper. Now it's about three pages. The same garbage you see on TV. Our TV is all owned by the Antichrist now. And it's pretty obvious the way things come across. And uh, it took me 30 years to realize I was living my hypocrisy and finally come to realize uh, the only thing I got in this world that's worth anything is, is my faith. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> I get kind of emotional. I'll try to get through this song, all right? Oh, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> dang, I don't know if I can. <clears throat> this what? world is not my home I'm just a passing through my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now on would go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and 
and I can't feel it home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I had no friend like you. I have, if heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I had no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what would I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Want something? You got one? King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. I'm down here in trouble, send an angel by my way. Well, if you're sick and afflicted, and you don't know what to do, just call on King Jesus, He will see you through. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. I'm down here in trouble, send an angel by my way. They put old Paul in a prison along that midnight hour. He looked up toward heaven. Jesus heard his prayer. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. Paul's down there in trouble. Send an angel by his way. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. I'm down here in trouble, send an angel by my way. Well, I've been down in the valley, and I've reached that mountain top. I'm looking for that city, Lord, I just can't stop. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. 
I'm looking for that city, Lord. Send an angel by my way. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. King Jesus, I know you'll hear me when I pray. I'm down here in trouble. Send an angel by my way. All righty then. No, I am not going to sing. You can't make me. <laughs> Go along with me. All right. Today is uh, the Sunday, the weekend that we honor veterans. Uh, you deserve so much more from this country and a thankful nation than one day a year. But that's what has been set aside. Next week is going to be our Veterans Appreciation Service. Couldn't get everybody together this week is why we didn't have it. I started over four months ago trying to put it together, and evidently I should have started five months ago because it couldn't have, couldn't everybody be that I wanted in place for this. So next week we're going to do it upright. We're going to give a dinner. Kevin Walden will be here. He's going to officiate. Everybody knows Kevin. Uh, and we want to give a day that this church sets aside to honor the service and the sacrifice of the American soldier. Uh, you deserve so much more, but that's what we're going to do next week. But this morning, uh, if you have served in the military at any time, would you just please stand to your feet for just one minute? All right, so here's what we're, I'd like for you to do. Uh, it's going out over the airways worldwide. I would just like you, if you would, give your name and what branch of service that you served. Uh, Jack Widener, United States Marine Corps. Jim Bennett, U.S. Army. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service. John Carroll. U.S. Navy, Submarine Force, and U.S. Army. And Desert, Desert, and Desert Storm and, and Operation Iraqi Freedom over in Lebanon. And Lebanon. Thank you, Bob. Bob McCullough, U.S. Army. Brother Dan. Daniel Johnson, United States Naval Aviation. I would like to say, Brother Dan, you have a church home right here and a church family that loves you, buddy. Don't you ever think you ain't loved? There he is. Scott Sheehan, U.S. Army. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all for your service. You can be seated. Amen. Thank God not all of America has turned their back on the American soldier. Amen. Amen. Matthew 26 in your Bibles this morning. Matthew 26, verse number 46. All right, Matthew 26, verse 46, and the Bible says, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. 
And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Father God, as we bow before the throne of grace, Lord, we want to thank you for everything that's been done in your honor and your glory. God, we want to give a special thanks to the American soldier for their service and sacrifice. And God, may this country and this church never take for granted the freedom and the liberties that we enjoy. And may we never forget not only the American soldier, but may we never forget our Savior that bled and died and went to the cross and the grave for us, that we would have a way of salvation. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. And Father, we pray for the power of God upon this message. We pray, Father God, that you would give us the words to say in the message of the hour. We pray that you would search the hearts that have been represented here this morning. And God, we pray that you will give a blessed day to every soldier and their family. We love you. We thank you, giving you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and amen. amen. Now, I would like to mention, and we will do it next week, but it's not only the soldier that we recognize, but it's the soldier's family because you serve just as much as they have. Amen. Yep. amen. And so without a good, strong family and a home front, the soldier couldn't do his job. He has to have his mind on the battle at hand and the enemy that he's facing. We have a story here of the Lord Jesus Christ is about to do battle, and it is one man against a devil and all of the evil and the wickedness. So what hangs in the balance? My soul and your soul whether we're going to spend our eternity in heaven or in hell. Now, that's, that's, the bat, that's what's on the battlefield. Amen. And what is standing between Jesus Christ and our salvation is the fact is there's a debt that we couldn't possibly pay. And Jesus gets out his checkbook, if you will, and he's, as he's being arrested, he writes it out. And the memo of it is paid in full. Because there was a debt that was incurred at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve decided to covenant with the devil and sin against God. Heaven just was closed. They were cast out of Eden, but the heaven was closed. And heaven remained closed until Jesus paid that price. And watch what he's doing now. This is his time. This is his hour. And he's about to go pay the sin debt so that you and I can come out to the house of God and worship a God that died for our sins, opened up heaven if we'll accept him as Savior. And not only that, but he blesses us in the midst of everything. But he's about to go make all that possible right here. And here comes Judas. Because this is a battle, we, a battle that we can't help him fight. This was why he was born. This is why he came to shed his blood, to give his life, raise it up on that third day, defeat death, hell, and the grave, put the devil in his rightly place, take the authority away from him that he has over humanity, and pay the sin debt free and clear. He's not making payments. He's not under the gun. It ain't like he can't keep payment book up. He paid it in full when he went to the cross of Calvary and rose on the third day. Jesus must fight this battle alone. This battle began in heaven and continued in the garden and was going on until that one day where he, the soldiers came to arrest him. He said, I've got to be turned over to the hands of sinners. And he went to the cross and he paid that debt. And so now... 
The devil has tried to stop Israel. The devil has tried to stop the Jews. And the devil has tried to stop Christ from paying that debt. He wants us all to be miserable, suffer, die, and then go to hell with him. And God said that ain't happening because I made a promise to Adam and Eve that there's coming a day that I would come back and buy what belongs to me. (laughs) Thank God what started on that day is continuing today and until he calls us home. Here's notice what he said. He said, in verse 46, he said, the first thing, I want you to rise. Sometimes, church, you and I have got to get up and be a part of what is going on. We can't sit back and let everybody else do it. We each have a battle of our own, and all of us need to stand up and say, I am in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I've got to choose sides, I want to wear the uniform. I want to make sure that I'm on the right side. I want to make sure that I'm present and accounted for. Much of this world doesn't know who we are or what we do or what we stand for or which army we're serving in. It's time to put the devil, the wicked, and this world on notice. If you're a born-again Christian and it's by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, raise your hand in victory to let us let this world know I am in the army of God. He paid the sin debt. I belong to Him. He's not fighting this war alone. Thank Thank God he defeated the devil on Calvary and I'm standing with God today. And so you now you've got, he says, I just said, boys, you need to rise up. He says, it's beginning to start. The battle was the Lord's. But what God wants is us to show our unity in the fact we're fighting with him. We belong to him. He's fighting for us. It's all about letting the world know which side we're on. Amen. I say the church has been silent is the reason that wicked can get away with what they're doing and the church church needs to rise up and be identified and say this is who I am today and so he says rise up and then notice what he says next it's let us be going you see God said boys sleeping on the job that ain't going to get it done Uh, distancing yourself from the fight and distancing yourself from me he said that ain't how you get counted if the world don't know which side you're on if you can't choose a side if you can't make your allegiance known what good are you to the Lord Jesus Christ He said, let us be going. That means he wants us to go together. That means we're all in this. We're going in the same direction. That means that cross still means something to us, amen. That means that Bible's still the word of Almighty God. That means when you come into this house, you're coming into God's house, and you're not coming in here just to enjoy. You're not coming in here just to hang out. You're coming in here to worship a living Savior, that one that rose on that third and appointed day. His name is Jesus. Why in God's name is it that people don't care to pray in public as long as they don't use the name of Jesus? If you ain't praying in His name, you ain't praying to the one true and living God. He said, let us be going. He started those men right off the bat as He was being handed over to sinners. He said, you all need to be identified with me. And somehow or another, we've lost sight of that as a New Testament church. We've got weak, we've got ashamed we afraid somebody might say something. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If you're ever going to stand up for anything, don't let it be your political party. You don't let it be your astrological sign if you believe in that garbage. You let it be the fact that I'm going to stand up and be identified as one of Jesus. Yeah. Let me just go ahead. I, I, I'm about where I want to preach. And he says this. He said, let us be going. He wants us to stand up and be united. He had 11 men. You know the ones that that there were his preachers. It wasn't Judas. He was counting with them. He never was one of them to start with. But what he was saying is this. He said, it's time that we got up from there. He, They let him down when it came time to helping him pray. They just too tired and they were sleeping. But God says, there's things in your Christian life that you can't.
can't sleep your way through, that you can't not do, that you can't pretend doesn't exist, that you don't want to be a part of it. If you have been saved and you have been born again and you claim Jesus is your Savior, you must identify yourself in this lost and dying world. I belong to Him. I am one of His. It's time that we stand up for who we are through the Lord Jesus Christ and quit being that silent. Quit being a closet Christian. Quit being the ones in the shadow. Stand up and let the world know who we are. So now, he's saying we got to do it together. Well, we've already been fractured by denominations. Denominations has fractured Christianity. Because it ain't about being Christian anymore. It's about being Baptist. It's about being Pentecostal. It's about being Methodist. It's about being Catholic. It's about being Seventh-day Adventist. And we spend more time and effort trying to prove we're the ones that's right and everybody else is wrong. And all the while, people are dying and going to hell. It ought to be, I am a Christian. The Lord is my Savior. However path you choose to walk, once you get saved, it won't do you any good till you get saved. And so he's trying to get them to identify. Yes, they ain't but 11 of us in this entire world. They ain't but 11 of us preaching. They ain't 11 of us to establish a New Testament church. But I want this Israel to know I'm standing with him. He might be in handcuffs. He might be under arrest. He might be nailed to a cross. But I ain't a bit ashamed to let you know I am God called. I am God sent. I belong to him. You can nail him to every cross in Israel he's still my savior amen Amen. let me tell you what the American soldier wasn't ashamed to put on that uniform that represented their branch of service in the United States of America now did they when they showed up on the battlefield every enemy that they fought World War I, World War II Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan wherever that wherever the world takes place when they came up on the battlefield and that American soldier was standing there in uniform and in gun, they didn't have to guess who they were fighting against and the greatest fighting force in all of this entire world is the American soldier it don't matter what branch of service they serve but may I tell you that after this American soldier thank God the greatest fighting force in this world is the Christian amen that identifies with the Lord Jesus Christ the strongest force in this world lives on the inside of every born again believer and all those around the world that are anti-Christ that hate Jesus hate the church hate the Christian hate the Bible they need to know they're fighting against the greatest fighting force that's ever been that's the American Christian amen So now we find the fact that the devil, have you ever thought about something? Do you believe that the devil had been discipled? Oh, not the devil. Oh, yes, he had. I got to get that cough drop unstuck from my teeth first. Do you not know that every time that Jesus ever preached, every time he ever cast out a devil, every time he ever healed infirmity, the devil was there for all of it. He wanted an inside look. Judas brought him to every service, brought him to every synagogue. I mean, there's times, what did he do? He had to cast out devils so that he could perform his work in in the synagogue. The devil can't be saved. The devil cannot repent. The devil cannot be restored. The devil cannot ever go back to heaven. He can never become God's angel ever again all that is in the past but here's something I want to get across and I've got to preach it or bust and the fact of it is is that he was there for every time that Jesus cast a demon out and sent him screaming and trembling and crying for his very existence he was there every time that then somebody came into the house of God and they bound up by the devil and that he set them free he was there for every time that he broke open the bread of life and 
told us what our hope was, and our hope was with through Him. Every time somebody got saved, the devil had to witness it. He was there to see what was going on. How helpless could the devil be when he realized he can't stop God? Yeah, he was discipled. He had to sit through every message about the truth. He was discipled when Jesus healed every sick person that came in front of him. He was discipled when Jesus walked on water. He was discipled when he calmed the storms. He was discipled when they, uh, flew, uh, when they sailed through a storm and went to Gadara and he cast out a legion of demons. The devil was around. He never got saved. He couldn't do nothing about it, but he couldn't stop it either. What I am trying to tell you, and I'm getting about 15 minutes ahead of myself, but I'll circle back around and catch up wherever I'm at. And the fact of it is, how many in this church and bless God you better throw him arms up how many has ever prayed a prayer and got a son or a daughter that was hooked on drugs or was ever stuck in the bottle how many has ever got a marriage that the devil said is going to throw apart but bless God they're still together and doing just fine how many has got a child that was prodigal and said they've went too far and done too much but now bless God they're sitting on a church pew how many has ever had a devil say they'll never get saved they're too wicked but bless God they've got the power of God and the salvation of God in their heart how many has proven the devil to be a liar you're sitting here in the midst of a chaotic world and God is blessing you Amen. that's because we had a God that said I'm going to fight this fight all you've got to do is just line up behind me and identify of who you are. We're here because he won the fight on Calvary. We're here because he turned himself into the hands of sinners. We're here because he faced the devil. And where I'm preaching on this message is at the time that the devil kissed God. And the devil kissed him through, the, through Judas the Iscariot. But what I am telling you, and I ain't got to it and don't know if I will this morning. And the fact of it is, we serve a God that not only defeated death, hell, and the grave. That not only defeated the devil in our behalf. But We've got a God that as this world goes wicked and this world gets wickeder every single day. Thank God we've got a place that we can come in and enjoy victory after victory after victory. I know we ain't got a house full this morning, but watch something else that I do know. And the devil just can't stop it. If we've got enough dedicated people in this church family that said, devil, I don't care what else anybody else does. I don't care if they backslide, if they don't come back. He said, if they go out and do whatever they're doing as for me and my house we're going to serve God and as long as there is a church that's got a door open that's got a preacher in the pulpit that's got a choir willing to sing that's got somebody willing to come out and to serve God if you'll just make a way I'll line up and let the world know I've been saved amen and I'll still serve him Tell me it takes the whole crowd. I'd love to have a church full, but God evangelized the world with 11 preachers that was willing to show up, and they were willing to say, I'm with him. But he knows all this. Let me just go ahead. He said, now... He said he's going to betray me. That means he exposed the devil. And the devil exposed what was going on to the danger to an enemy. You see, the devil had already been to every meeting they've ever had. The devil studied each and every one of them. The devil knew their weakness. How is it that you know what about the apostle Peter? Ain't he the one that denied Jesus three times? But let me tell you how he got there. He was the one in the front. He was the one that carried a sword to a prayer meeting. He was the one that walked on water he was the one that was willing to face down the entire Roman garrison and legion that came to arrest Jesus but the devil knew he had a weakness he knows mine he knows yours and he knew the apostle Peter as long as Jesus was there as long as he had back up with other disciples as long as it didn't matter if he's the only one that had a sword he would fight the enemy but the devil knew if you got him where he couldn't see Jesus if you got him where the disciples weren't around where he 
could see it. If you put him alone, he was just as weak as water. He wouldn't stand in the fight. And the devil got him by his devil's fire. The devil got him away from separated from the disciples. The devil got him where he couldn't see Jesus. Jesus had protected him and provided for him for three and a half years. But if he could get him away where he couldn't see Jesus, he knew he would deny him just like God said that he would. What I'm trying to tell you, if you want failure in your life, if you want failure in your church, if you want failure in your marriage, if you want failure in your family, if you want your kids and grandkids to fail, just turn your back on God. Get around the devil's fire. Quit coming out to the house of God. Don't you try to tell this preacher, I can be just as much a Christian at home on TV as I can if I'm able to be in the house of God. You lose something by not being here. And I'll say this, if you've gotten so lazy that God's give you a home, money in your bank account, a car to drive, clothes to wear, the health to be here, and you're too sorry and lazy to get out to God's house, shame on you where you are. And if you're not able, God bless you. I hope He blesses you three times as good where you're at. But if you're able, you're getting weak. If you're saying, preacher, you'd get a whole lot more in here if you quit preaching like that. Bless God, you better tighten up. Amen. You see, the devil knew his weakness. But what about Thomas? He knew that Thomas, no matter how many times God said it, no matter how many times he preached it, and no matter how many witnesses that he brought out to tell him Jesus rose from the grave, Unless I can see it for myself and put my fingers in the nail prints, he said, I will not believe it. What kind of an army does God have when you've actually got to have physical proof to believe what you should believe by faith? I'll do this if God does that. May I remind you this morning, God don't have to do nothing to convince you. It's by faith. Let me move on. I can, I can see it just slipping right out the door. You see, the devil was there. He said, he's at hand to betray me. And while Jesus was going to his heavenly father to gain strength in prayer, his disciples slept. Does that not kind of remind you that the day we're living in is that while God's church family needs to be praying for be preparing for the battle and we all got one do we not you ever wonder why the why you ever wonder why that's the devil's more successful with some than he is with others let me ask you this what's your prayer life like (laughs) what did jesus want them to help him pray about he was wanting to teach them to pray during the most difficult times that they did listen it's all easy to pray when you got one person up here says bow your heads and lead you in prayer but let me ask you a question and it's all good that we have prayer requests we bear one another's burdens we do all that and we pray for one another we pray without ceasing i get that but what about when you can't get a hold of your preacher What about when you can't get a hold of a prayer warrior? What about when you can't get a hold of nobody and you're the only one there to intercede and to pray? Have you learned how to pray in difficult times when it's impossible? He was about to be turned over to the hands of sinners led by Judas, led by the devil, and he was trying to teach them to pray during difficult times when God is not visible for you to learn how to pray when whoever you're depending upon to get your prayers through in the worst day of your life, God's saying, I want you to be the one that learns how to pray just like that. Because we tend to fail when we're not prepared for the battle that's in front of us. How I many this church already knows, but by living life in this world as a Christian, there's some battles a whole lot tougher than others. Huh? Some just kind of come and go. Others want to stay there a while. And we need to be prepared. We need to have that, have that book out. We need to study that Bible every day, not just for Sunday school and church. And Wednesday night services, we need to know what this word says. 
Jesus showed us the importance of that when he defeated the devil after starving for 40 days and nights and just simply repeated what the Word of God said. That's how much power is in the pages of this book. You can't, does, the Bible, does the Bible not say that the Bible is the sword of the Lord? Would you want to show up on a battlefield as an American shoulder empty-handed? Do you think this right here is all it takes to stop the enemy? All right, y'all, stop. This only works when the preachers went way over. Man, it don't work on me anyway. But I'm just saying, do you understand the enemy is there to destroy you? The devil and his demons are trying their best to put something in our life that causes us to stop. And as Brother Dan mentioned this morning, they have took advantage of this COVID, have they not? Well, they had a few small victories before, didn't they? Closed the church, stopped the assembling of those together. But now that ain't going to work again. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. You are going to be in a battle every day of your life on this earth. And so will I. And you need to learn how to fight to win. Amen. Amen. Two things. For this side, two things. For that side, two things. The middle, you just have to figure it out. It's this. Get you a strong prayer life that you can pray through whatever you're facing. Because I can promise you, with seeing all these little kids in this church, what the devil doesn't come after you after, he'll come after you after through them. Get in this book. This is for your help. You've got to have it. Amen. You see, when the word of God, which was Jesus at that time, was arrested and in handcuffs, if you will, Thomas and the apostle Peter didn't have him to focus on to fight that particular battle. Had they prayed and learned how to pray, Peter may not have denied Christ three times. Thomas may have not had to have him in person to touch him to believe. We'll grow stronger, will we not? Okay, don't look, don't look at me like I'm preaching in a foreign language. He said he's at hand. Why did he choose Judas? Why did he why does he choose some people and not others? I think I've just preached it, but let me just put it in Bob's English. He's studied you and me. He knows where you're weak. And he has got a stronghold over everybody that don't study this book and don't have a prayer life. Why did he choose Judas? Judas wasn't even one of him. He wasn't even interested. You know what his motivation was? Jesus had multitudes following him. He was famous. He was the one everybody sought after. If I can get me 30 pieces of silver and be the one that turned Jesus over to him, then I'll be the one and they can focus on now. He wanted to be noticed. Have you not seen that seems to be something that's running away in America today is people that just want to be noticed? That it's all about them when they preach. It's all about them when they sing. It's all about them, their name up here and there and everywhere. And so Jesus is saying, all right, you want to be the one that everybody notices and follows? Have at it. But I won't be within a thousand miles of what you're doing. Let me preach on. See, I liked it a whole lot better when I wasn't preaching down this road, didn't you? Oh, well. Judas. Here, I want to get this out, out, out of the way and then we'll be done. Judas, he was finally leading his own multitude, wasn't he? Not at me. Why is it y'all seem like you red bulls done wore off? <laughs> All right, we're going to try this again. Judas, he was one of the 12, was he not? Yes. If you see me do this, that's, a, that's fine. You go ahead and have at it too. He led a multitude because the devil needed this right here. 
He needs disciples in order to disciple other lost people, right? He needs examples. He needs to show something. That's why these beer commercials. That's why you don't see what really happens to an alcoholic in a home, now do you? What you find, and the, everybody's happy, everybody's pretty, everybody's got all kinds of money. They've got new boats and jet skis and four-wheelers and camper trailers, and they're just as happy as happy can be. They don't see the wife that's got the black eye. They don't see the kids that run and hide under the bed. They don't see the fact of the fact of it is they're broke because daddy's got a drinking problem. They don't see the fact of it is they don't know from one week to the next they got a place to live or any kind of food. And these took and stole their childhood and hurt somebody forever by the life that they lived through drinking. He don't show you that. He just shows you the other side of it. And so the disciple, the, the, the devil needs a disciple, but he doesn't want all of his. He needs one of Jesus' disciples. Why that? Why does he need just one? And why does it have to be God's disciple? Because if he can get one and make them their, his puppet and get them to say what he wants them to say and live like he wants them to live, he knows he can get a bunch that once followed after Jesus to follow after him simply by an example. And if they're successful and if they're happy and if they're right, it must be the fact of it is to follow Jesus is wrong, but to follow the disciple of the devil is right. Amen. Amen. If he can get you to just stay out of church, others are going to follow that example. If he can get you just to drink a beer every once in a while, others are going to follow that example. If he can get you to change your Bible, others are going to follow that example. Whatever he can get somebody else to do. Have you ever seen the fact that some of these mega churches, and you know they ain't straight with the Bible, but yet you see how successful they are. Now you got Baptist churches trying to do what they're doing. Yeah. Instead of doing what God has taught us to do. Amen. Because the devil just wanted one disciple of belong to Jesus. They, nobody except the Lord, knew he was lost. Nobody but God knew that he had never been saved. But the fact is the Bible says he was counted with them. And if I can just get this one. And how Judas was so ready, was he not? First time in his life he had 30 pieces of silver. He was a millionaire. But not only that, but now he had his own multitude. And now he's got people following him. So you see how greed and jealousy works together? I ain't never had this kind of money when I was doing what Jesus said, but now I started listening to the devil. It still looks like I'm following Jesus, but in my heart I'm really following the devil, but it don't seem too bad because my flesh has been satisfied because now i got a pocket full of money. Have you ever thought about how greed has enticed a multitude of preachers that once preached the truth and didn't care about the paycheck? And the fact of it is now their pockets are lined. They're living in a, in a, in a million-dollar mansion that the church provides. They get a new Cadillac every year. They'll fly them here and there. They meet every need. They've got more money than they've ever had. But bless God, they've sold out for the truth. He never promised any of his disciples they'd ever be rich. But Judas, he went after the money straight forward. And it's, ain't that something about having a pocket full of money just takes all those fears and they just melt away. And now he looked behind him and he was the leader. He was the one they followed. He was the one that was in charge. But oh, what a cost. He, what, a, what, a, what did it cost him? He traded salvation and heaven for greed and hell. And you're going to find this. Now listen to me. You're going to find this. It'll work for a while. It worked for the prodigal son until he ran out of money. It'll work until judgment shows. And somewhere after he did what he did, the Bible says that Judas just realized that he had betrayed innocent blood and threw the money down. So everything he sold his soul for, he just threw it away. It didn't do him any good. And you understand, you might live a lifetime 
of turning your back on Jesus Christ, turning your back on the church, and turning your back on what you know to be the absolute truth. But you're going to look around in the casualties of what you've done is going to catch up with you. When your kids are all hung out on drugs and living wickedly, when your grandkids are following suit because that's how they were raised, they give up on church. Does anybody in this church except for me know what a slippery slope it is to turn your back on God? It ain't just you. It's everybody around you. And so Judas gave it up, did he not? Sold him out and covenanted with the devil. I'm not telling the truth. I'm about done. If you don't start going along with me, I'll preach another 20 minutes. I can preach another hour. I'm good. And you see, he, when he sold out and did what he did, that was directly what affected the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Thomas because they had already seen by example. Let me ask you a question. Don't you raise your hand. Do you want to be the one in your family that sets the example that's going to take your kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids away from God? Am I telling the truth? And you've got to ask yourself, What kind of an example do I set for the rest of my family and for my neighbors? Am I faithful to the house of God? Do they ever see me read the Bible? Do they ever hear me pray on their behalf? Or is that just what we do when we go to church? So you see what you do in your everyday life, your service to God. John, you was in the military for an awful long time. You had good soldiers in there, did you not? Did you have some that just wasn't up to par because they wouldn't commit? Which one would you want to fall in the battlefield? The ones that are fully committed to the cause of the other ones are just there. Amen. Who do you want to follow in your Christian walk? Somebody that's fully committed? Do you not want to be the one that your children and your children say, I want to be just like mom and dad. I want to be like my grandpa and my grandma. Do you understand the difference you can make this morning in somebody else's life? Time's running out. We We don't need to be like the Apostle Peter to a place where I love God when I'm at church, and as long as I'm surrounded by my church family and that preacher's up there just shelling the corn, I'm a strong Christian as anybody. But what are you Monday morning at work when you're the only Christian in that group? Or what are we teaching our kids when they're up there at God bless their heart in the public school system? And they're the only Christian in that class or in that group. Are they going to be strong enough to stand for God? Do you understand how serious this is? Because I want to tell you all something. Church and preaching and pastoring ain't a hobby. It's my life. It's at the very top as far as being a pastor and a husband and a dad and a grandpa and a retired truck driver. Because that's my identity. I want you to know preaching and passion is right there. That's how serious it is. And that's how serious it ought to be in your life. Do you right now see anybody in your family kind of headed the wrong direction? Who's going to be the one that makes the decision? Devil, not my family. You ain't getting them. Well, we come to the piano and get a song of invitation. I just want you to know how serious this is. You think the devil's going to give up? He will not. Do you think it's because your kids that he's not going to come after them? When the American soldier fights a battle, they don't leave that battlefield unless two things happen. They're injured or killed in battle or they win. We don't show up just to hang out and fight a fight. Our soldiers show up to win that battle. They want victory before they leave. Why can the church not have the same thing? Amen.
How many just raise your hand right now and say, Bobby, I believe every word you're saying. While we stand to our feet, let's come to pray. Yeah. Amen. All right. Anybody got anything on your heart and your mind before we dismiss? All right. Six o'clock tonight, we'll come back and do it again. Also, if you'll notice these four lights here in the front, they're different from all the rest. Now, if you're sharp minded like I am, I don't miss nothing, do I, Regina? Lord, forgive me. You're going to find they're a whole lot brighter than the other light. All right, Jim and Brian came down and changed it, but you'll notice there's a yellow ring at the top. Well, there's two light bulbs that are yellow lights that hadn't been changed. They just want everybody to see what it's like. So we're going to decide tonight when it's darker. But everybody, several people kept telling me the lights are getting dim. And I thought, well, my diabetes, my eyes are dimming, they're getting worse. Maybe the yards too, but evidently we're not going all bad at the same time. And so I really like this. And it ain't, and there's 98 bulbs in this sanctuary. And I don't know if that's counting them two back there or not. Okay, so there's over 100 bulbs. So what do y'all think about that? Pretty nice, ain't it, to be able to see better? Cheaper than going to the eye doctor. But I'm thinking maybe now we'll decide. I'm thinking maybe we'll just change the whole church out and put it right there. What do you think? Yeah. You'll be able to see better. Yeah. Can't go with that. All right, then. Uh, next week, we won't be having Sunday school. We'll be having the veteran service. I encourage you to come out for that. Uh, if you know someone, please invite them. And to come out for that, because we want to honor the veterans and their and their families. We're going to have a dinner. Of course, we won't be having church uh, that Sunday night. We won't be having Sunday school. Uh, and then the following week, which will be the 18th, or maybe that's in December. All right, I'm going to stick with November. We'll stay there. We'll worry about what happens in December when it gets here. Next week, chat, okay? Where's all the kids at? All right, young people, you, 4.30. There you go. Come on up here, buddy. Look at that little bow tie right there. Appreciate these kids, and I am so proud of every one of them. Amen? All right, y'all ready? And they lifted holy hands towards heaven, and they shouted, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord!